Episode 41 of the Academy of Management's Origin Series. Um, this is uh, moving towards the end of our series with this current group of um, uh, this current editorial team. Um, and, but I'm really excited about the paper that we're going to talk about today. Um, the paper is entitled The Role of Temporality in Institutional Stabilization, a Process View. And um, talking with us, we're going to have the two authors of this paper, Juliana Renica and Tom Lawrence. And um, in order to just get us started, if the two of you can just briefly introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about where you're at and a little bit about your research identity. Well, thanks so much, Greg. Um, I'm Juliana Reinecke. I'm a professor of management studies um, at Said Business School, University of Oxford. I'm Tom Lawrence. I'm also at the University of Oxford in the Said Business School. I'm professor of strategy here. Perfect. Well, thank you. And thank you for um, spending this time with us. So uh, the, the, the paper on temporality and institutional stabilization, just in the title, sounds like a bit, bit of a paradox. Um, but if you want to just give us a little bit of a sense of what is this paper about? What's the sort of elevator pitch for what you've got in this in this conceptual paper? Yeah, um, thanks so much for telling us, challenging us to, to kind of do this ele elevator pitch because it's not so easy. Um, yeah. um, but basically, I think this paper is based on three conceptual shifts that we're exploring. And the first conceptual shift is, is from seeing, institu seeing institutions as these stable, durable structures to seeing institutions as fluid processes that are in flux and that are ongoingly changing. The second conceptual shift is, is about um, moving from seeing time and temporality as these external measures of change in institutions to um, seeing time and temporality as an inherent dimension of um, of institutions. And this moves us then putting this together to this shift of really seeing um, seeing time not as this external measure, but seeing time as a dimension that actually stabilizes institutions once we have reconceptualized them as these more fluid processes that are in ongoing change. And I know this is a bit of a sounds a bit of a paradox because usually we associate time and temporality with change. So we kind of invert um, um, invert this relationship a little bit. Yeah, and to me that was almost the most interesting piece of the paper is that you you pick this up and you you sort of see institutions and so you expect okay they're these things that sort of exist in perpetuity, but then we know that there's been all this work on institutional processes and destabilization and dy dynamism and change. But now we're using sort of the same theoretical apparatus of time and change and, and evolution, but to theorize their stab stabilization. So very intriguing approach. Who would you say is the target audience for this paper? I think there's really three main audiences, and two of them are really anchored in the concepts that you know, the, the paper evolves around. So one obvious audience is uh, scholars interested in institutions, uh, including people who do institutional theory, but other people who kind of use uh, focus on social institutions more broadly, where the contribution for them is trying to move from this conception of institutions as structures or blocks or entities to an idea of institutions as processes, which we think is closer often to people's experience of them as well. The second audience is really process uh, scholars, people who do process organization scholarship, people who come from a kind of processual or process theory uh, lens and language, and often they don't focus particularly on institutions. Um, a lot of that work is uh, broadly social, but often organizational at, at the level, like the organizations as processes. And so there hasn't really been a lot of work within that world on, on institutions and processes. And the third is really people who could use the uh, interplay of institutions and processes for more topical, practical kinds of um, research that looks at specific social phenomena they see as kind of puzzling because maybe it's a social institution in some broad sense, but it's very um, potentially dynamic. Uh, or 
um, you know, we'll talk about examples in a minute that, that where things that we thought were relatively stable get, get um, turned over, or things that we thought were relatively dynamic become stabilized over time. And so I think there's a kind of broader audience for this as well. Awesome. Um, so, so one of the things we try and understand in the origin series is the sort of evolution of a conceptual project that translates into a paper that gets published in AMR. And often this is a little bit of a sort of ethereal process or, or um, a, a process to some of our, our readers or listeners. Um, so can you give us a sense of how this paper got started and then a little bit of what the evolution of the project looked like as it as it developed and evolved? Sure. So, I mean, <clears throat> the obvious joke to make in relationship to this paper is it's a paper on tempor temporality that took forever to write. Um, <laughs> so it's a kind of got an atemporal quality to it. Um, uh, it started out, um, we both have long standing interests and commitments to time and temporality and social institutions, but had never really uh, done work theorizing them very directly. Um, and we st it started out really looking at the kind of intersection of uh, time and agency and institutions with the idea of being actually to do a review paper for the annals. Um, and like any good paper, it got rejected. Uh, first time with our first conception of it um, for, for a number of reasons. One was it, um, the focus was kind of too narrow and too broad in some ways, and so it wasn't really well scoped. But the other thing was that the feedback from the annals reviewers, quite rightly, was that we were doing more theorizing than we were doing kind of synthesizing and reviewing. Um, and so we took that as inspiration uh, to say, okay, well, maybe they're right. Maybe this is a theory paper instead. So it pushed us in that direction. That's actually pretty interesting to know and, and, and useful to hear, not only for me, but for many of our listeners, where there's often this sort of, well, what is the distinction between annals and AMR? And how do I know if I should be going for one or the other? And... Um, and, and so can you just maybe uh, underpin what 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 was the distinction or the, the feedback from the annals editors that said, well, this might be something here, but it's not really for annals. Um, can you get a little bit more specific on on sort of what they were saying and, and, and hence what inspired you to maybe think about AMR? I think there's two things. I mean, I'm trying to remember exactly what they said. It's a little bit challenging, to be honest, at this point. But yeah. the, if we look at the paper, though, one of the things that makes it not an obvious annals paper is that the two kind of conceptual elements to it, processes and institutions, have different traditions, different scholars associated with them, different communities. Uh, and so we're really kind of reviewing two literatures and synthesizing two sets of ideas, um, which I think can work for an annals paper, but makes a more challenging annals paper. Um, annals papers, I think, are easier when there's a more understandable um, kind of single com either community or set of communities that are easily put under one umbrella. Um, and here it was really playing with the relationship between two sets of ideas that are in many ways quite mature uh, and been developed over a long period of time, both within management and outside of management, uh, but then looking at, well, how do they interact? And that sort of is a kind of classic AMR strategy. Um, what if you took two concepts and brought them together that aren't normally brought together? And I think the second element was that we were not simply synthesizing the literature out there. Um, we were doing more than that. And we were developing an argument around what institutions are and how we can think about them that had been made not really in the institutional literature before and not really in the process literature because they have talked about the world being in flux and so on but haven't applied this to institutions so in that in that synthesis we were doing something that was that was quite novel to both audiences so it went far beyond just um summarizing um the existing literature in a generative way but mm -hmm. yeah Awesome. That's that's incredibly helpful. Thank you. So so you said that this this paper has taken a lot of time or has um, existed for a long time and has evolved over a long period of time. 
what sort of kept the two of you engaged or caused you to come back to it, even if you might have stepped away from it for a while? What's what's uh, what made it interesting enough to just want to want to want to stick with it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one was this um, really this interest in in well, this puzzle with this definition of institutions as being stable and enduring and the world around us not being stable and enduring. And I think, I mean, the idea started before the COVID pandemic, but during the COVID pandemic, it became so obvious to us that everything around us seemed to, seemed to change, but yet we were kind of desperately trying to stabilize this, this kind of changing world that, was, that we couldn't predict and we didn't know how tomorrow would look like. Um, and so I think that became just quite, quite, a, quite an existential experience. Um, and also temporality during that period became such a defining feature of our daily lives, right? Because we couldn't go anywhere, so the spatial dimension fell away. Um, and so the day became about scheduling um, and having meetings. And so the temporal elements of what it meant to do, you know, to, to, um, to do a course or something became such more, more pronounced. And so we felt, well, there's something really here that now we see in its extreme form because we can't really move anywhere. But it, it's, it has been there all along. And so I think that's kind of what not motivated it, the mm -hmm. pandemic, but I think that's where we really felt that, okay, there's something really in here that, that really speaks to the experience that we're going through at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and when we started to look, it's one of these kinds of papers where when you adopt a frame around something, you start to see it everywhere. Um, and so you surface, and part of it's just projection, but part of it is actually also just kind of realizing this sort of temporal quality of things you didn't think of as inherently temporal. Um, to draw the... Um, yeah, the example. Sure. So we have an example uh, we can give you, and you can tell us if you can see the whiteboard. Do you want to so do that next... as, as much better uh, handwriting <laughs> than I do? Um, okay. So... So, oh, which places would you? So, um, what we, what we started to think about was, if you think about institutions as having uh, not external measures of temporality, but intrinsic internal dimensions of temporality, what would that start to look like? And so we started with um, temporal patterns, uh, with the idea that uh, different institutions have inherently different kind of rhythms and durations to them. And so one example we thought about, and we talked about a lot over the, the time, because it's central to our professional experiences, the academy management meetings, the OM meetings. Um, and if you think of them as an institution, they're quite easy to cast as an institution. They're stable, they're enduring, they're meaningful, they shape a lot of people's lives. Uh, so they kind of fit quite uh, neatly into the kind of institutional frame. But as Julianne was saying about COVID, once you start to think in temporal terms, they also have a very strong temporal quality to them in terms of patterns. So they're annual, uh, they occur over the same roughly period of time, and it, it, it matters to people whether they are extended by a day or, or, or not. It mattered to people when they were shifted uh, uh, a few years ago in terms of what part of the week they would occur in. Um, but then actually there's other rhythms to it in terms of over the course of the year, there are patterns associated with it for authors and reviewers and if you're on a board uh, organizing it, if you're a local arrangements person, there's very, very strong kind of cal sort of calendrical, rhythmic sort of patterns to it as an institution. And then what we started to kind of play with was the idea that there were these different dimensions, but they were linked. And so there's this idea of temporal expectancies, which is um, a, a concept from temporality uh, writing, with the idea being that uh, there can be observable patterns associated with some sort of phenomena, but more than that, there are uh, expectations or expectancies in the sense of uh, deadlines, uh, processes that sort of become requirements that are temporal. Um, and so if you think again about the academy, then you think, okay, well, it happens cyclically and, and annually and so on, but actually, there are reviewer deadlines, there are submission deadlines. Uh, if you are organizing it, probably your life is driven by a calendar for many months beforehand in terms of scheduling and so on. There's the date that the schedule comes out, there's the actual schedule itself, and all of those put uh, expectancies in place which shape 
the experience of the institution and its effect on people. And then the last part, which is where the kind of cycle, the cycle comes in uh, to think of institutions as temporal, but also as having this kind of cyclical quality between the dimensions uh, of temporality is the idea of temporal mechanisms. And this is just the idea that if you look at the temporality um, in terms of the pattern, so you talk about an annual pattern that creates certain requirements and expectancies in terms of uh, reviewer deadlines and submission deadlines and so on, then there are mechanisms of entrainment that if you uh, are going to uh, be connected or associated with that um, uh, institution, there's this idea of entrainment from writing on temporality that as individuals, we entrain, and, and not just as individuals, other organizations, uh, whole other kind of uh, parts of the academy, and train with the academy management meetings. Um, so we organize our holidays around it. Uh, we think about our professional life in regard to those deadlines. We free up time for it. Um, we, if we don't go one year, we suddenly have found time uh, and so on. And so those mechanisms then link back to the patterns and this becomes a self-reinforcing re cycle of temporality. And so this, the point is really so much the model is going back to your question in terms of like what kept us going. What kept us going really was this kind of ongoing deeper and deeper engagement with the idea that institutions have these temporal qualities that aren't talked about very much. Um, there's been a move to talk about the kind of the material side of institutions and to some degree the spatial side of institutions, the idea of place and the monality and so on. But the temporal side is still relatively kind of unexplored, even though it's really central to how people actually experience institutions. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. It's fascinating from a number of different perspectives, but the one that that really strikes me is, you know, when we stepped in as associate editors at AMR, and and this paper was already in process by then, but we had to step back and ask ourselves, well, what would be interesting things to examine from a theoretical standpoint that would be highly generative. Um, for, for for management, organizational, institutional theory, um, and we decided on 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 three things. And essentially, the two that came from the team were time and temporality, and we've got a special issue coming out on that. And the second was disruption and disruption to institutions. And this paper all, almost captures perfectly or could <laughs> perfectly in any of those special issues. So it doesn't surprise me that it was engaging enough to stick with it because these are sort of central issues that I think as, as organizational and institutional scholars, we're grappling with and don't yet have a, have a handle on. And this gets us much closer to that by and having that language, having that, that framework, having that perspective about the role of time in these institutional processes. So I can, I can see why it would have, would have gripped you. So, so where did, what, what evolved or what changed from the first submission as you started? I, I saw that it went through about four rounds. It had R4 on the, on the, uh, on the version. So you obviously got a lot of feedback and stuck with it um, through, throughout the review process. What were some of the shifts, changes, and things that you were pushed to do or felt compelled to do in response to reviewers? I mean, I think our initial starting point was really this this puzzle around institutional stability and institutions. But I think we shifted our motivation, I don't know if it was like an R1 or R2, towards more talk about temporality and institutions per se. But then we went back again because we felt this is not really what motivated us. This is not really what, um, you know, I think we did it in response to some feedback, but we kind of went back and said, no, our motivation is actually this, this, this puzzle that we started with. And so we went back and we didn't, um, um, uh, and, and I think that was really helpful. So that was one thing, one change that we went through and we went back to our original a puzzle but of course in the process we had put in a lot more thinking a lot more concepts conceptualization so i think the idea really matured much yeah. more than um in our initial submission and i think the other thing that changed that initially we were much it was much more as 
I don't want to say essayistic, but we were more kind of exploring what is process view, what is process ontology, how do we think about institutions as processes. So that was more focused on reconceptualizing institutions and temporality has always been in there, um, but it was kind of, um, it missed that kind of step towards theory development. Um, and initially, I think we, we thought maybe get away without developing a model. <laughs> yes. But I think then um, we actually did develop a model and we realized that this was really generative for our own thinking to actually have a model and kind of force ourselves, how do we think these things actually hang together? And what is the relationship between them? Um, and so that's when we kind of more explicitly linked the temporal patterns to the different dimensions of institutions. And then we went back to the definition of, okay, what are institutions? What makes institutions institutional? Um, and um, the, the first element is, is uh, the notion of institutional meaning. Um, and we then thought, well, temporal patterns, they're really central to institutional meaning. And if you change the temporal pattern that can change the meaning of what an institution is. Very, very obvious examples is um, um, we talk about fast fashion, for instance. I work also on, on fashion and uh, garment textiles. And so, um, you know, suddenly fast fashion means that um, uh, a clothing item becomes a disposable good rather than an investment piece. Um, it has all sorts of complications um, for, for other elements of institutions. Another example would be the 24 hour news cycle. So news are not you know, breaking news um, at certain points of the day, but with the internet suddenly it's an ongoing news cycle and that kind of changes what we actually think are news. So how temporal patterns like, like rhythm are really tied to the meaning of institutions. Um, and then to think this further, um, then um, how, does then, how does then these temporal patterns and the temporal expectancies that are related to them also change institutional or uh, the dimension of institutional prescriptions because institutions um, or to the definition is also that they're not just practices or, or habits that we do, but they're associated with some cognitive and normative um, um, prescriptions. And so um, Tom mentioned the example of uh, the academy and um, or us as reviewers. Um, um, so, being on time, submitting a review on time is like part of what it means to be a good reviewer. So the expectancy of you know, the deadline also is an institutional prescription um, of um, you know, yeah, being a good reviewer, being an AOM participant, what does it mean, um, and so on. Um, sorry. I'm going to the way. You want to do it? No, 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 no I'm, I'm just worried they can't see the uh, board. Yeah, OK, yes. Um, um, and then finally, um, this really um, this really then um, shapes institutional participation or how temporal mechanisms shape institutional participation. Um, and here we also move a bit away of um, scholars typically talk about compliance with institutions. But when we really think about institutions as changing and as processes and fluid, we thought, well, what does it really, what does compliance really mean? Well, it means to be a legitimate participant in an institution that is an ongoing process. So, um, and the temporal mechanisms and here the notion of entrainment, so entraining to, to a certain pacer, um, like a deadline um, or a particular uh, rhythm, um, like the fin financial year submission deadlines and so on, is then really what shapes the part our participation in institutions. Um, again, like, you know, AOM as an example um, coming up. So we're kind of, you know, in the, in the process of preparing the PWs and our, our papers and so on and making travel arrangements. And um, so it's very shaped by um, the, um, the temporal mechanisms um, that are in place. And I think that was kind of the main evolution um, that happened throughout the submission process. I think that was, came in relatively late, right? That we kind of um, moved towards this model and then really developed this. and it was actually really helpful to kind of push our thinking and be a lot more precise of, um, about what we mean. It was interesting when the, the, the model that we drew is a, a cycle, a circle, mm -hmm. and we'd always thought about it that way. Um, but actually it was only in the R4 round where the model had always been a linear model with a kind of big long feedback loop on it. And our editor, John Amos, said, like, why do you do it that way? Like, you talk about it, and it seems to 
me, you're thinking about this thing as a cycle. Uh, so why doesn't it look like a cycle? Why does it look like this linear model? Because we never, we start the argument with meaning, but we never meant that there was some fundamental starting line for it and a, and a finishing line, because the whole point was not how institutions become stable in the sense of stable structures, but how they are stabilized over time on an ongoing basis. Um, and the, the just even that, you know, in some sense trivial shift from a kind of straight line with a feedback loop to a circle kind of got us much closer visually to how we'd been thinking about it anyway. And, and it was one of those kind of ironic points where you think, oh, why didn't we do that, you know, at least a round or two ago, but um, thankfully for good editorship, uh, it puts us in the right direction, so. Awesome. So most of the examples you've used have, and as my mind's been jumping around to your examples, most of the ones I've come up with tend to be, have an annual sort of flow to them. Did you find that 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 was the case? And are there examples that exist that are not necessarily annual, but have some other kind of time or, or temporal cadence to them? So, so one thing we talked about a lot, just the two of us, was the 24-hour news cycle. And the all of the changes that happened in the news business and in news consumption that came along with 24-hour news. And it was obviously a shift um, from, in some sense, a daily uh, rhythm where the morning paper would be where the big breaking news would be, or maybe the five o'clock paper, we also have that. And then there was a six o'clock news broadcast across you know, broadcast stations to this ongoing 24 hour um, cycle. But it didn't just change the rhythm, it changed the meaning of what news was, what counted as news. So if you're gonna fill, 24 hours of news on what was at, at, you know, at that time a cable broadcast news station and then ultimately on the internet, then news has to be a lot broader conception of what's new and what counts as a scoop or a, what counts as a breaking news. So the bar became much, much lower in terms of you know, what was actually counted as important news, what people did, the kinds of people that were involved, who you wanted to see, um, uh, announcing news changed over time, participation in news changed. And then that, you know, if, if you think about the, the people who try to uh, influence news, so government people, PR people, spokesmen, uh, spokespeople for different organizations, they're all almost on a very different clock. Um, and so we saw, I think both ways, some things becoming uh, shorter, uh, but then probably also potentially some things becoming longer. Or less relevant. So, so that's a that's an excellent counterexample. And almost in you doing that, I started to say, well, if you start to think about different temporal chunks, whether it's a twenty four hour or a week, I can start to think about things that happen institutionally, or a month, or a year, or or four years for the Olympics, or. Um, and so you, you can come at it from that direction, or you can come at it from the institution and say, what's the temporal sort of pattern within this institution? What's the right cycle to think about it? So start from either. Um, so when, so, so when, what, what impact do you hope that the paper will have? What influence on, on either theory development, empirical research, future practice, future policy? Where, where would be the, the, the ideal sort of impact for the two of you as you project forward? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think as Tom said in the beginning, I think it has the real potential to bring together institutional scholarship with process scholarship. Um, and I think there's an emerging, um, an emerging um, Community certainly practice scholarship and institutional scholarship has um, has created a conversation. I think there's a lot of scope for um, for process scholarship to and institutional scholarship to do the same. Um, and I think um, the model looks quite abstract and the argument is quite abstract. But I think there's kind of some practical um, some practical value in there too. I mean, first of all, I think it provides a conceptual foundation to 
understand this 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 kind of world that we live in, which seems to be in constant crises and flux, and we don't know when the crisis ends and how the crises are interdependent, and everything seems to be changing all the time. And so we have this concern with trying to, you know, stabilize things as they are, as we like having this like, looming climate emergency. So there's this concern actually, you know, with trying to stabilize things in a world that seems to be changing um, all the time. So I feel that kind of, you know, on a fundamental level, it can maybe help to provide a different theoretical um yeah perspective to to grapple with this world um, um but i think they're also um i mean i also work in the space of sustainability and climate change and temporality plays an enormous role when we think about climate change um first of all the time scales are very vast there's the conflict between short-termism and kind of long-termism but also if we then think about our sponsors, say the you know, net zero as, as a target by 2050, it's a, it's a temporal target. And what does this mean in today's temporality? And um, so what does it mean for you know, how we think, uh, how we have to think temporally about our institutions, what we have to do um, now to, to meet this target? Um, and I guess that's another element that we, here we talk more about rhythm, but we also talk in the paper about temporal depth and how the past and the future become enrolled into the present of institutions. And so I think for this for the sustainability climate dimension it could be incredibly important to incorporate time into the into the debate. Any thoughts, Tom, from you in terms of where, where, where you might want to see it go or, or, or people pick it up or use it in any ways? I mean, I think um, really I'm just captured almost all of it. I mean, the only thing I would kind of add or echo really is that uh, most of my work uh, over the long term has been around institutional theory and institutions. And I think there's been uh, a kind of search in that community for new kind of energizing ideas, um, and particularly a frustration with trying to understand what counts as an institution, what is an institution. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the useful things about conceptualizing institutions as processes is it can serve as a more kind of um, experience-based understanding of what an institution is and also a more inclusive understanding that I think could be quite useful very broadly uh, in kind of writing on institutions. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think this is a really fundamental paper. Um, it's It incorporates... A, a lot it incorporates different perspectives but sort of sets us up with extremely valuable theoretical apparatus to understand more about what's going on and to get closer to sort of institutional shifts that lead to new stabilizations and new perspectives on the world and i think you do a great job just sort of in sum sum summing it up both from a theoretical standpoint but then also really making it real with these valuable examples and you end off with sort of the perspective of COVID and how that's changed our perspective. And I, and I found it um, incredibly enriching and enlightening to read and it sort of changed my view on um, much of what I experience from day to day and much of what I feel like is imposed um, many times. So uh, thank you for, uh, number one, prompting me to read it. Number two, for putting this out in the world so that we've all got something to use to better understand what's going on. And number three, just for sharing a little bit of your story, backstory to the paper here, so we can all learn from that. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Juliana. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much for the kind words, and thank you for the opportunity. And thanks for the entire editorial process that has been really mm -hmm. developmental, very constructive. Um, and um, I think that we really kind of, you know, elevated our ideas yeah. from like this level to, well, I don't want to be too. Well, we'll say thank you to John for that. So thank you, John Amos. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thanks, John. Thank you. <laughs>